Now, Peter walking on water. This is an interesting one, and uh, I just want to bounce kind of a new idea off of you as far as myself. Um, and I was reading in the book of Job, and this really hit me. And I want to uh, just uh, propose this as an idea for you to consider. I'm not saying this is gospel, this is the way it is kind of thing. Um, I don't know. I haven't heard too many people say this, but I just uh, haven't heard anybody say this. So I just, I'm not, I'm not whenever I, I discover something myself, I'm always, I always question it, whether it's actually legitimate. But I just want you to think about this. This is Jesus walking in the water. You remember in chapter 14, you have Jesus walking in the water. Peter then says, uh, if it's you, really you, Jesus, let me get out of the boat with you. Peter gets out of the boat, and he takes a couple steps. He sees the waves and stuff. He freaks out. He falls in. Jesus then pulls him out. And, um, you know, when Jesus gets into the boat, when Jesus gets into the boat, what do the disciples conclude? They conclude, you are the Son of God. Jesus walks on water, and they conclude that he's God from that. Now, how does that work? Well, it seems to me, and actually it was over in the book of Job, and I read this in the book of Job, and and it's just interesting. He walks on water, and their conclusion is, you are the Son of God. How do they jump from walking on water to God? Now, check this out. Um, In the Old Testament, uh, Psalm 68 and other places, God is portrayed as the rider of the clouds. Uh, and it's a kind of a, I think, a spoof and a, a put down of Baal worship because Baal was the one that ride the clouds. And God says, no, no, I'm the one who rides the clouds. That is, I am the one who brings in the rain. It's not Baal who buzz the rain. I am the one who brings in the rain, the rider of the clouds. In Job, it says this, Job chapter 9, verse 8, he alone stretches out the heaven. Who stretches out the heavens? He alone stretches out the heavens. It's talking about God. He is the one who stretches out the heavens. And what else does he do? And treads on the waves of the sea. He stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. And so it seems to me that what do they see Jesus doing? They see Jesus treading on the waves of the sea. And they conclude, whoa, Who is the only one who treads on the waves of the sea? This is what God does. God stretches out the heavens, and he treads on the waves of the sea. Now, you've got to understand a little bit about Jews in terms of the... The Jews were kind of like mountain folk, okay? When you get into the land of Palestine, you've got the you know Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea, kind of on your right side. It then comes up into a mountain about in Jerusalem area, about 2,700 feet up. The Dead Sea, about... uh, 1,300 feet below sea level. So you've got, what, about three, 4,000 foot rise there, and then down to the Mediterranean Sea. So you get the Mediterranean Sea, the coming up, and so they're usually mountain people. The Jews don't do the ocean very well. And so when they talk about the ocean, the ocean, the Mediterranean Sea, these kind of things, they usually talk about the great ocean things as, as, as representing chaos, as representing chaos. And so when the sea is raging, that there's chaos to them. They're not sea folk. They like the mountains, the protection, the you know, stability, the mountains and stuff. The seas are chaotic and always changing and frothing and stuff like that. And so the seas represent chaos a lot of times. And so what you've got is God walking on the water and uh, Jesus calming the sea, calming the sea. The chaos is calmed by his word. Chaos does not overcome him. He does not engage it. He calms it. He walks on the waves of the sea. And so you get Jesus and just showing his power as God. And it's interesting, too, that Peter gets out of the boat and walks on it. And uh, this year, I thanks for some students asking questions in class and things. But you've got, Jesus, you've got Jesus walking in the water, and then Peter walks in the water. What's the significance of that? And I wonder whether it's a little glimpse of the kingdom of heaven. And what you've got is... Not only does Jesus, as God, tread the, tread the waters, but then here you've got a disciple, a follower of Jesus, treading on the water as well. And I wonder if that shows that as the kingdom comes, that someday we will have dominion over the whole earth, as Genesis, you know, Genesis chapter 2, man was given dominion over the earth, that someday there will come a time when we will walk on the water like Jesus did. And Peter, with Peter, you get a little glimpse of that that here's the kingdom happening. Peter walks in the water. This is the destiny of humankind as we have dominion over the earth. No longer will chaos rule, but we will walk on the water. 
And so, uh, you know, just a little, maybe a little foreshadowing there of the coming kingdom with Peter and things. So just, just some ideas there, not pushing them very strongly because I, I have questions about some of that myself, but it's just, it's interesting. They conclude after seeing him walk on the water that you are the son of God. Now, kingship and the kingdom of heaven. A lot of people have said, uh, what is the kingdom about? The kingdom is where the king rules and the king is Jesus Christ. And so um, these are some things that point out the kingship of Christ in this kingdom of heaven, which is a major theological theme in the book of Matthew. In the genealogy, uh, if Jesus Christ is a king, does a king need a genealogy? A king needs a genealogy. A normal person, yeah, kind of, but mostly a king needs a genealogy. And by the way, who's who does Jesus' genealogy go back to? Uh, Dave Matthewson brought this up, and I think and if you listen to his lectures and stuff in a brilliant way, on the first verse of Matthew, in the book of Matthew, Jesus Christ, the son of David. Jesus Christ, the son of David. And so the genealogy is showing Jesus' connection as the son of David, the one who is going to fulfill the Davidic covenant and come from, Matt, or from 2 Samuel chapter 7, that David's throne is going to rule over Israel forever and ever, and Jesus Christ now is coming as that great son of David, who is greater than David, who is greater than David, his son who will rule forever. And so his genealogy goes back to David, and it also goes back to Abraham, and the fulfilling of the Abrahamic covenant, and spreading out to all nations, and things like that. Jesus Christ, in the Old Testament, when we did Samuel, you remember, uh, when a king is made, Samuel is made a king, what's the first thing a new king's got to do? Kind of the same thing in the judges. When a judge is made in Israel, what's the first thing the judge does? What's the first thing a new king of Israel does? First thing a king of Israel does is he goes out and he wins a military victory. He's anointed king. The first thing he does is wins a military victory. Jabesh Gilead, Saul's case. Does anybody remember David? David is anointed in 1 Samuel 16. David is anointed king and then chapter 17, the next chapter, David's anointed in 1 Samuel 16. The next chapter, David goes out and fights Goliath. So the king is anointed, and then the king has a major victory. And that's the role of the Goliath story in relationship to the kingship of David, and, and just literarily. Now, who is Jesus? Jesus now is the king. He is the son of David. What does Jesus do? Jesus goes out in the wilderness. He's baptized by John the Baptist. In one sense, that's his anointing. He's baptized by John the Baptist in chapter 3. And in chapter 4, then, Jesus goes out into the wilderness and in one sense redramatizes Israel. Whereas Israel was in the wilderness and they flubbed it up and they messed it up, Jesus now will go in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and Jesus will become the true Israel. And where Israel failed, Jesus now will be tempted by Satan and he will succeed where Israel had failed. And so basically, it's his victory over Satan. When Jesus goes out into the wilderness, that's his. He's just been anointed in chapter 3. In chapter 4, he goes out in the wilderness and defeats Satan. Okay, turn these stones to bread. Throw yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple, and God's angels will pick you up. Don't tempt the Lord your God, Jesus said. Takes him up to a high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. Bow down and worship me. Jesus says, you worship God alone. And Jesus then refutes Satan all three times, actually quoting from the book of Deuteronomy from about chapter 4 to about chapter 11. Uh, Jesus using scripture to refute Satan. Very interesting uh, battle there between Satan and Christ. Now, the Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, do you remember Jesus? They were asking him to see whether he would heal this guy with a shriveled hand, withered hand. And Jesus says what? Um, the Sabbath is made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And and basically, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. And who is the Lord of the Sabbath? God, Jesus, okay? He is called the Son of David nine times in the book of Matthew. Nine times the Son of David, which again shows Jesus as king. And by the way, in the picture scripture, you, you can see uh, portrayed Jesus as, as Humpty Dumpty with a crown on his head because Jesus is portrayed as king in the book of Matthew. This Son of David thing occurs nine times. The other gospel writers only mention it three times. So Matthew has like three times as many references to all the other gospels, uh, synoptic gospels, with this son of David. 
And then we'll come back to this later, but you see this DVD over here is 14. Um, another aspect of Christ's kingship, I think, is found in the genealogy. Let me just kind of cover that now. We'll come back to it in, a little bit later on. In the genealogy of Jesus Christ, in Matthew chapter 1, uh, you get this interesting statement where the, uh, um, he's going through the genealogy of the various kings. And as he does that, uh, he concludes the genealogy, and he goes through all the kings of Israel, starting with Abraham as the father of Isaac, Isaac as the father of Jacob, Jacob as the father of Judah and his brothers, and then he goes down through the various things. David was the father of Solomon, Solomon who had been, you know, Solomon was the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam the father of Bia, goes down, and then they exiled to Babylon. And at the end of the genealogy, it says this, Thus there are 14 generations in all from Abraham to David. Abraham to David, 14 generations. And from David to the exile to Babylon, 14 generations. Abraham to David, 14. David to the exile, 586, when the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. Okay, the temple, 14 generations. And then 14 generations from the Babylonian exile to the time of Christ. That number 14, 14, and 14 comes up. And you say, well, we actually know that that's not really right. That actually, if you go to uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 8, and you compare that to 1 Chronicles 3.11, 1 Chronicles 3.11 says, wait a minute, Matthew, you skipped the names of three kings. Three kings are skipped. Why does he skip three kings? He's trying to get it to 14, 14, and 14. And so he skips three kings. We know from 1 Chronicles 3.11 that there were three kings that he skipped. We know the names of those kings. Well, they're kings, so we know all the names of all the kings of Israel and Judah. And so, but he skips three. Why does he do that? He's trying to make it come out to the number 14. Why is the number 14 so significant? Well, back in American culture, I'm looking at a clock on the wall now. Uh, when you see numbers, you see what? It's 12 o'clock. We use... Our number system and our alphabet system are two different things. We've got A, B, C, D. Those are our letters, and that's what we write with when words. You've got one, two, three, four. That's our number system. We have a separate number system, Arabic numbers, from the, uh, our letters. Our letters are different than our numbers, and that's very handy then to be able to separate numbers from you know, what you'd normally write. Back in uh, Jewish times, first century and things, they used a principle called gematria, and there's some debate on this, but uh, I just want to kind of broach this idea um, where the numbers and the letters were the same thing. So basically A would be 1, B would be 2, C would be 3, D would be 4. And so D actually in Hebrew is 4, V is 6, and D is 4. And you say DVD equals, and if you do 4, 6, Four, that turns out exactly to 14. Well, the DVD, now you say, what hell, this is a prediction in the Bible of DVDs 2,000 years before they ever existed. Matthew is telling us about DVDs. Yes, he is telling us about DVDs, but you also remember that the vowels, the vowels were added later, that initially the Hebrew language was just strictly consonants. And I want you to look at this. DVD, who is that? Put in the vowels. Who is that? David. D-A-V-I-D, David. And so what, Jesus, what Matthew is doing is he's using the genealogy of Matthew to say 14 generations. Jesus Christ is the son of David. 14 generations. Jesus Christ is the son of David. Jesus Christ is the son of David. And he uses that in possibly in that kind of a way. And that's why he's doing the 14, 14, and 14, to say Jesus Christ is the son of David, the king of Israel who's going to reign forever and ever. So these are some, just some interesting things, I think, about how Matthew is portraying the theology of Christ. Here, Christ is being portrayed as king.